just stand and sing along.
rather nicely. I made an executive decision. Uh, we were going to have vendors come in and set up on the lawn, and I was going to advertise for that, but uh, I was feeling a little overwhelmed with our small yard sale turning into a large yard sale, so I decided against the vendors. So just one thing I can check off my list of things that uh, I don't have to deal with, so and we will do just fine. Um, which is coming up June 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th, set up on the June the 21st, first thing in the morning. So, Leona, are you doing something? I'm going to sing. And kids, we're going to stay out here while Leona sings, so don't vacate when I'm doing the prayer, or after the prayer, please. Okay. Uh... Should we sing first? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Ray Lynn, come on up here. It was Ray Lynn's birthday. She is now officially a teenager. And uh, she, like we've always done before, it's an equal opportunity embarrassment church. So, and you shouldn't be embarrassed for your birthday. You'd be glad that you made it. Do you have anything you wish to say? Come on up here. Up here where people. Jim, she wants to tell you she's going to be 12, not 13. Give us 12 years of wisdom. Are you 12? Bro, oh, oh you're working on 13. 13. <laughs> oh, you seem like a teenager already. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're going to be a big, big girl. So, okay. Let's everybody sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Cha, cha, cha. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. 
birthday, honey. She does seem like a teenager, <laughs> but that's been the last, last three or four years, it seems like it's a teenager. So, okay, now we got that out of the way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you very much uh, for your blessings to this church, and thank you, Father, for your presence sitting in here next to us. And Father, I pray that there's people out there that, um, that are hurting still and need your uh, uh, healing powers down upon their body. Marilyn is one, and uh, and Chris Clark is another. Father, we know that uh, you have that ability to reach down and uh, and heal their broken bodies and be with the doctors as they make the decisions on what direction to go on their healing process. And Father, be with those people as they do. And we know Leona is constantly in pain, but she managed to be here this morning. Thank you very much for letting her do that. And and uh, giving her the ability to be here. And Father, I pray that you, uh, starting uh, right now, this present day, Father, send some more people into this church and uh, so they can learn your word, and Father, so we can fill these pews up, and, and it's never, never, never too late to be able to get in here and, and learn about uh, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And Father, it's... Uh, it will change her. We know it will change their life forever. Now, Father, as, uh, as always, uh, I, I pray that you be with Jason during the music. And, uh, and Father, uh, may the songs we sing be a blessing to you and a blessing to us. And be with our pastor as he uh, does the message this morning. Uh, may it also be a blessing. And be with me as uh, I work on teaching wisdom again this morning to these young people. And... Father, may they retain some of it, most of it, all of it. And Father, and, and it will help their lives for, for, from this day forward. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. As Jim alluded to, uh, the Spirit has placed a song in Leona's heart. And so she is going to uh, bring that forward for us today. All right, everybody sit down and be quiet.
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but sometimes hearing it in a little different way kind of speaks to us a little differently. So uh, thank you, Leona. Yes. We've got a couple more songs to have you sing along with, so I invite you all to stand up and sing along. But you hear me when I speak You don't keep my heart from breaking But when it does, you weep with me You're so close that I can feel you When I've lost the words to pray And though my eyes have never seen you I've seen enough to say I know that you are good I know that you are kind I know that you are so much more Than what I leave behind I know that I am loved I know that I am Even in the fire to live is Christ, and I is gain. I know that you are good. I will understand the sorrow, but you're calm within the storm. Sometimes this weight is overwhelming, but I don't carry it alone. You're still close when I can't feel you, I don't have to be afraid. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say.
this year's felt like four seasons of winter and you've given me pain to feel the sun always reaching always climbing always second guessing the timing but God has a plan a purpose in this you are his child and don't you forget he put that in your heart he put that fire in your soul
missing coin or whatever one you want to look at, I was turning everything upside down trying to find what was valuable to me and that was the keys to my motorhome. After finally driving around all over the place, having Jim and Diane check at the church and then driving back down here Saturday morning myself to check myself, I found my keys in the side pocket of the Jeep after the Lord put it on my heart to look there underneath the hand sanitizer and my brush that I used to comb my hair. I had used both of them and somehow the keys had gotten underneath and I looked in the pocket and I'm going, well, there's no keys in there, but when you lifted the stuff up, they were buried down underneath. The parable of the story is very simple. Here's the lesson the Lord taught me for three days, or took me three days to actually hear, I guess would be a better way of putting it. As diligently as you search for those keys, I need you to start searching for the lost. I need you to go after the lost just as bad as you went after the keys to your motorhome. So I think that's a message to all of us here at Waterford Baptist Cathedral, but it's a message to every Christian everywhere right now because the time is at hand where we need to be going after the lost with every fiber of our being because there's not a lot of time left to reach the lost. Amen? And so we need to allow the Spirit to lead us where we need to go in order to be able to reach the lost for Christ. But uh, with that story said and that lesson learned from that, I was, I was humbled by all of the search that I did. I tore the house upside down, the sheds upside down, everything, every vehicle upside down except for that pocket on my Jeep. For some reason I only glanced in there and thought, well, they're not in there. But that's where they were all along. So sometimes it's right before your eyes and you just can't see it, right? And uh, so uh, let us not get to the point where we can't see the forest for the trees. Amen? We're in the midst of this series that we began called Appearances. I think there will be one more message after this one in the series of Appearances, and then we'll get into a new series of messages probably the third week of June. But I have one more, at least at this point, planned message for this series, lest the Lord changes it this coming week, and uh, we'll go from there. So in this series of Appearances, over the past few weeks here at least in these Appearances, uh, we looked at how that, uh, when three weeks ago we were preaching about Stephen, that uh, the, uh, the nation of Israel uh, had rejected for, in a sense, the last effort uh, to reach out to them as a nation. And so Stephen, before he was martyred, said, you, you are, as your fathers, you can always resist the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, from that point forward, the gospel begins to be taken to the rest of the world, and especially to the Gentile nations, uh, in order to fulfill God's ultimate will from the very beginning of time, that both Jew and Gentile would be joint heirs within the body of Christ, and joint heirs within the kingdom of God. And so it began with looking at the conversion of those in Samaria as the persecution of Saul scattered them unto Samaria. And then from Samaria, uh, Philip actually went down after the Ethiopian eunuch, which is the descendant of Ham. And then the last week we looked at how then Saul's conversion as a descendant of Shem. And now this week in Acts chapter 10, We'll look at the conversion of Cornelius, who is a descendant of Japheth, or one of the Gentiles. And with this conversion, the gospel then has gone to all of the descendants of those who were descended from Noah after the flood. And that is every single one of you and I. All of us are either a descendant of Ham, Shem, or Japheth. So that means we all have the same roots back. We all have the same family lineage. Therefore, there is to be no prejudice. There is to be no separation. There is to be nothing more than one united family of God before the world. Amen? And the gospel is the only thing that can reunite the family back together again because the family at the present time is divided all over the face of the earth because of various interests, desires, prejudices, and everything else that keep us from coming back together as the family of God to be who we were called to be upon the face of this earth. And with that, I'm going to stop. We're going to pray before I start preaching. 
and, uh, and uh, so I don't get too far ahead of myself. Father, thank you for your word once again. Thank you for how that your word has been carried now to every descendant. And because of that, we know that the gospel is for each and every one of us. I don't care whoever we are, whether we're here in person or online or watching the recording down the road, the gospel is for you. The gospel is for every single person on the face of the earth. And the good news is that God has reconciled all things unto himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we can all receive the precious gift of salvation, but more importantly than that, we can receive the very spirit of our Father so that we can all communicate with our one Father through the same spirit that's given to us through the gospel message and through faith believing in the message that is taught, preached, and lived out before the world each and every day. Father, we ask that you would have your way in this message. Let your words be formed upon my tongue and within my heart. And uh, Father, just may you be glorified in everything that is said and done here today as we give you all that honor and glory right now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Looking at Acts chapter 10, uh, we're going to just pick up the story. There's a lot of scriptures. I can't remember exactly what I entered into the computer Wednesday night. Uh, I don't think that all of them are there. I think that uh, from about 9 through 30, I didn't actually enter in. I think I skipped over, but I could be wrong. So maybe they'll be there, maybe they won't. But we won't look at every single passage of Scripture, but we're going to go through them very quickly, just mentioning them, and then we're going to pick out some things uh, in the first part of the story and in the latter part of the story, which is the emphasis of the message here today. Amen? So in Acts chapter 10 and verse 1, it starts like this. At Caesarea, and Caesarea is that part where it's a Gentile city. The city of Caesarea, or the region of Caesarea, is the area where the Gentiles dwell. This is a, a Gentile region of Palestine and of that area just north of Jerusalem. So at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. He was a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment, or a Roman Centurion from Italy. And he had an army of Italian Regiment men who were under his charge. And so listen to this story. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those who were in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, can you imagine this scene here for a moment? Now, there were times of prayer that was always followed throughout the generations of the nation of Israel and also carried on by those Gentile, God-fearing Gentile believers, right? So at 9 a.m. in the morning, 12 noon, and 3, 3 p.m. in the afternoon were the times of prayer. And so he's particularly praying here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was that third time of prayer that many who were devout and were followers of the, at least the Judean way of looking at God and those who were had the one true God that they were worshiping and believing in, those that followed the proselytes, if you will, also practiced those times of prayer. But notice, if you will, something about Cornelius and all of his family, even though they are God-fearing and they are devout, they are not proselytes to Judaism. And we're going to talk about why here in just a moment. So Cornelius stared at the angel who spoke with him in fear. And he said, what is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Would it be surprising to you would it be honoring to you if all of a sudden an angel appeared while you were praying and worshiping God in spirit and in truth? If an angel said, by the way, your prayers 
And your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before the face of God. I what, say, praise the Lord. what would you do? Amen. Would your would your reaction be the same as Cornelius's, or what would your reaction be that your prayers and your gifts to the poor have been a sweet smelling savor unto the Father? Is what the angel is saying, right? And he's well pleased with you, right? And we might think, wow, this is a really Somebody who's really in tune with the Father and someone who's really got their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they're on the road to heaven. Amen? Amen. We're going to learn in the story, he's not even saved. We can be God-fearing and not be born again. We have to have the Spirit of the living God in order to be part of the family of God. There's no greater privilege on the face of all of the universe and especially the face of this earth than for a father to impart his own spirit into his children. Every father wants his child to grow up with the same spirit, the same character, and the same characteristics that he himself has. And sometimes, let's be honest, those characteristics aren't always all that good, right? Right? Sometimes fathers impart characteristics under their children and carry on a generational curse within that family because they don't know God at all. But they're still passing on their spirit which is cursed unto the generation ahead of them and it keeps getting passed down from generation to generation. That's why in the spirit we sometimes have to go in and break generational curses over top of families because of the wrong spirit being imparted through those generations of children. Amen? But here, the greatest privilege is for the spirit of the Father, and if our Father is our Father in heaven, for Him to bestow His spirit unto you and I is to give us everything that we need to become exactly like Him. Amen? The spirit of our Father is inside of each and every one of us who've been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father. He is the spirit of Christ. He is the spirit of grace. He is the spirit of truth. He is the spirit of mercy. He is the spirit of glory. He's all of these. The sevenfold spirit of God is poured out by the Father. As soon as Jesus had finished his work and was seated at the Father's right hand, he received of the Father the gift of the Spirit of the Father, and it was poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost. And by the way, this is Pentecostal Sunday, if you didn't know that. Today is Pentecost. Today is the day, 50 days after Easter. Amen? Amen. Today is Pentecost Sunday, right? We celebrate Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit of God. And in this particular message, the pouring out of the Spirit of God upon a Gentile Roman centurion who was Italian in his relation to the communities of the world, right? What is it, Lord, he asked? The angel said, your prayers and gifts that come up as a memorial offering before God. Now listen. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. Now, let's put yourself in Cornelius' shoes for a minute. God says your, your prayers and your gifts have come up for a memorial before him. Now send some men to Joppa to find one Simon, who's also called Peter. And you go, what? What am I going to do that for? Right? We've got to listen to the whole story here, right? He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. See, God knows everything. He knows exactly where we are. He knows exactly what moment we're there. He knows everything, right? And he's letting Cornelius know exactly where Peter is at so he can send someone after him to bring him back, right? When the angel who spoke to him had gone... Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants and he told them everything that had happened and he sent them to Joppa. Now I want you to realize 
what some of Cornelius' prayers were most likely like, right? Cornelius was God-fearing. In other words, he wanted to know the one true God, but he wasn't about to become a Jew to do it. No way, Jose, was he going to be circumcised and become part of the Jewish culture in order to get to know the one true God because of the prejudice that existed between Jews and Gentiles, right? And we're going to see this unfold here. God is in this story not only taking the gospel to the Gentiles, but he's also breaking down the wall of prejudice that has separated the family of man from the beginning of time. Amen? Ever since Cain rose up and slew Abel, the prejudice has been there. And God is right here in this story tearing down the walls of prejudice and saying it cannot exist within the kingdom of God. Amen? Point number one is pretty easy if you like points. Your prayers and gifts are a memorial offering unto God. So pray more. Offer more sacrifice of praise and offering and give good gifts to the poor when you can. Amen? Now, if God was only working on one end of the story, we would probably lose the significance of the story. But Peter is at the house of Simon, who's a tanner, and it's about time for them to cook a meal. And so I'm just going to surmise about 30 verses of Scripture here without reading every single one of them, right? And so as it's being prepared for them to eat, Peter falls into a trance up on the roof. And in this trance, he sees a sheet being lowered down, held by its four corners. So in other words, like four ropes just lowering down to the earth. And on it are every kind of animal, clean and unclean. And the Lord tells Peter, he says, rise up, kill it, and eat it. And Peter's result, of course, is because he's a kosher Jew. No, Lord. Never have, have I eaten anything that's unclean or impure. Right? And the Lord says, never call that which I have cleansed impure. Right? And he does this three times so that Peter gets the message. Aren't we like Peter? Sometimes the Lord has to show us things three times before we go, oh, that's what you meant. Right? We, we, we're like Peter. We don't always get it the first time, right? Because sometimes it rubs us the wrong way, right? Uh, no, Lord, I've never done anything like that. No, I would never do anything like that, Lord. And then he has to show us three times what it is that he wants from us. Amen? Before we finally go, Okay, not my will, but thine be done, Lord, right? Because we're stubborn, selfish people sometimes, amen? Every single one of us. And the sooner that we'll admit that before God, the quicker he can do things in our lives sometimes, amen? So, as the vision descends the third time, the men who have been sent by Cornelius are knocking on the door, trying to find Simon Peter, right? So let's pick up the story right there. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, verse 21. Why have you come? Good question, right? Why are you here? I mean, Peter has no way at all assimilating this vision that he just got from God with the men knocking on the door. He hasn't tied the two things together yet. He doesn't know they're all one and the same, right? He's just, what is it that you want, right? Same as you and I would be doing, right? And the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-free man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him that you have come to this house, that he could hear what you have to say. And then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Now he puts it together. Right? Oh, that's why you showed me that vision. These Gentiles are knocking on the door. Yes, Scripture did say that Jews and Gentiles would be joint heirs in the blessings of God. And the knock on the door, he finally puts it together. He says, come on in. That was against the law. For him to even invite them into his house or into the house where he was staying, right? It was against the Jewish cultural law. It wasn't against the law of the word of God. 
It was one of those laws that were added by the Jews to protect themselves from the rest of the world, right? So it was illegal for them to even invite a Gentile into their home or enter into the home of a Gentile. And so this is why we know God is breaking down the walls of prejudice and breaking down the walls of separation between Jew and Gentile. Amen? The next day, Peter starts out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along with him. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them, and they called together all of his relatives and all of his close friends. Now, we don't know how many people this is, but if he already has an Italian regiment under his command, I'm assuming that his friends and relatives is a pretty good-sized group of people, right? I'm assuming there's at least a couple of hundred folks here, right? that are anxious and hungry to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Talking with him, Peter went inside and he found the large gathering of people. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the button. The following day he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives as a close friend. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter said, get up, stand up, I am only a man myself. See, Cornelius thought that God told me to send for Peter. He must be this high-ranking officer within the kingdom of God. So it would be custom for the lower to bow before the higher to receive the blessing from the higher, right? Whatever form that, that might have been like. And Peter does what he's supposed to. He's, huh? <laughs> Don't bow before me. I'm not God. I'm just a man just like you, right? I represent God, but I am not God, right? Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to him, you are all well aware that it is against our law. See, he makes it clear it's not God's law, it's our law. Our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or even visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Here's point number two, if you like points. Salvation is of the Jews. God sends a Jew who's prejudiced against Gentiles and a Gentile who's prejudiced against Jews in order to bring this unity together and break down these walls and salvation is of the Jews. That's what Jesus said to the woman at the well of Samaria. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. We know the one true God. Because salvation is of the Jews. God gave his word to the Jewish people. Amen? And so salvation comes through them. Even though they failed in their task of taking the gospel to the whole world. By the way, we're failing in it too. And if God judged them, we better be careful, right? We better be careful. Cornelius answered, four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour. See how God is in his timing? Peter arrives at Cornelius' house at the exact same time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the time of prayer. The same time that he was praying four days before, right? God is so perfect in everything that he does. Cornelius, God has heard your prayer, and he has remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. And we know the rest of the story. He brought, they all brought Peter back. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize. Click. Light bulb. Oh, it's all coming together now. Now, I, now I'm understanding. You see how slow we are sometimes and kind of put the whole picture together that God's trying to get us to see? So he goes on to tell the story. Then Peter began to speak. And I'll realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. God doesn't have any favorites. He loves every single one of us exactly the same. Amen? Amen. Now, there are some who are more needy than others. Amen? Amen? But there are no favorites. But just as you and I are human parents, sometimes the child that lets us know that they have need of us, more often and more loudly, gets more attention than the one who sits 
quietly, right? Oh, you don't get what I'm saying. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <laughs> might be a squat. <laughs> it might be, right? But anyways, they get the attention sometimes, right? But God accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. And we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. That's the reason why even still today that people who didn't believe can say, well, I don't know of anybody that saw God. I don't know of anybody that saw him after he was raised from the dead. Well, that could be true. Because he only showed up to the believers. The unbelievers did not see him once he resurrected from the dead. Right? Everybody who saw him had believed in him. Right? Except for Saul. Right? Cornelius now. Except for a select few. Right? But they were still God-fearing people. Amen? We are witnesses of everything that he did in the country, Peter said. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and of the dead. All of the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's just a simple gospel message, right? Simple gospel message. We don't got to put a whole lot to it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jews first and then also unto the Gentiles. Right? We want to do all of these other things today and God says it's just the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Just tell them about me because that will save people. That will get people born again and get their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen? Not that some of the rest of that isn't helpful, because it is. But somewhere in it, put the gospel, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Right? Point number three is pretty clear. The spirit of adoption and of sonship is for everyone. There's no one who's excluded. He tasted death for every man so that we would not have to die, but so that we could receive eternal life and live forever in His presence, and live forever with His presence inside of you and I. Amen? Amen? Conforming us to the image of His dear Son, Jesus Christ. There is no greater story that's ever been told anywhere than that. What an exchange takes place when we believe. We receive the Spirit of our Father into us, so that as His children, we can become like our Father. And so as children of the Father, we can be one family of one mind and of one spirit and of one accord as we gather together, wherever we gather together, whatever day of the week we gather, and whatever we're doing when we gather. As long as we gather somewhere. That's what Hebrew says in chapter 10, right? Not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Families have stopped gathering today. My own family has stopped gathering. We've talked about a family reunion for 10 years, but it still hasn't happened yet. Right? And we do that. We talk about that family reunion of let's all get back together again. And God is planning a family reunion. Amen? And he's saying, I want you to get together now so the reunion won't be a shock when it comes. Amen? Because we're not used to gathering together as the family of God and celebrating His presence each and every day. Amen? Sunday's not enough, folks. We can't just celebrate God on Sunday mornings for an hour. We've got to celebrate Him 24-7 as the family of God. Wherever that we are. Amen? 
while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles? you got to read it like that, right? Because of the prejudice in those there. You can't give them the same thing you got us. They're Gentiles. Right? Isn't that the attitude we sometimes have, right? The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, and wrapping this up. Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Do you see the order here? Believe, receive, be baptized. Believe, receive the Spirit of the Father, and then be baptized. Amen? We've got the cart before the horse sometimes today. We're trying to baptize people who've made an emotional decision from God, and then they don't have that Spirit of the Father, and they're not truly born again, but we made them feel safe and we've done a great disservice to them because now they're twice as hard to win to the Lord because they think they're okay. But just like Cornelius, they might be God-fearing, they might be church pew sinners, but they aren't born again. They haven't received the Spirit of the Father yet. And so they're not part of the family of God. And they're the hardest people in the world to reach because they believe they're okay. And we made them believe that. Amen? And God is saying, get out there and seek the lost and bring them into the kingdom because I want all of my children filled with my spirit and gathered together so that I can bring them to the place where I dwell. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation and it is no respecter of person. The, God, the gospel is for every person everywhere, regardless of what human ethnicity that they have, because we are all descended from one root. One root, Noah. That goes back as well now even to the second Adam, Jesus Christ. The seed of the word is the same seed that we are all born again by. And so just as every man has the seed in himself, and every woman can receive that seed and give birth, the seed of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is received into our hearts by faith, and that seed produces after its own kind. And then we are all one of the same family, of the same spirit, of the same baptism, and of the one Lord and one Father in heaven. May you be glorified through our lives and through this message, Father. Amen. As a reminder, the ways to give are on the board behind me and uh, if you're online as well. We've got one more song. I invite you to stand and sing along.